everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. It's wonderful to see so many of you joining us this evening or of course morning, afternoon, middle of the night, whatever time it is where you're signing in from. And I'm absolutely sure we'll have people signing in from all over the world for this event. Um, wherever you are, I am delighted to welcome you on behalf of the How To Academy. And I know this will be a real treat of an hour, a chance to see just how sort of simple it can be to bring a sense of calm and uh, above all, a, a kind of rewarding therapeutic creativity into daily life without needing to carve out endless hours or, or empty the wallet in the process. And that's what the book that has inspired our event is all about. I can honestly say I've never enjoyed preparing for an interview more um, than on this occasion with this as my, as my prep um, 30 Days of Creativity, Draw, Colour and Discover Your Creative Self, which is of course what we're going to be talking about. And it's full of wonderful, imaginative, but easy to follow drawing practices and colouring practices that you can incorporate into your day, just however best fits you. Um, but you haven't come to hear me tell you about this, of course, when we have the author, um, the artist, ink evangelist and queen of colouring as she's become known um, with us herself. Um, she is, as I'm sure you'll know, an internationally best-selling artist and illustrator, and not just the creator of this book, but of many more too. Uh, I'm sure many of you will know them, including Secret Garden, Enchanted Forest, Lost Ocean, Magical Jungle, um, Johanna's Christmas, Ivy and the Inky Butterfly, I could keep going on, um, and Worlds of Wonder, I should mention, and World of Flowers, so there we go. And to date, she sold over 21 million colouring books worldwide, which is quite extraordinary and, and wonderful. Thank you so much, Johanna, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Lovely to be here. And I should say in happy publication, because I think you're right in the sort of throes of all the publication. Is it today it was published, the book? Uh, no, it was a few days ago now, but it's always a bit staggered because we do the UK one day and then the US two days later. So it feels like, you know, one big long birthday celebration. Um, well, we're so grateful. Thank you so much. And before we talk about the book, as I was saying to you before we sort of went live, there's so many different places to go with this. And um before we get on to the book, I'm sure people will be fascinated by how you became the queen of colouring. And, and, you know, did you always want to go into being an artist and an illustrator? Um, what was it that led you to, to this place? Yeah, well, I'm one of those really annoying kids that always knew exactly what they wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted to draw. So after, you know, my childhood spent drawing on walls and annoying my parents, uh, I went to art school. And there I ended up doing textile design, which people find funny. They're like, did you not do illustration? But the story is, the true story, the illustration department in a Duncan Dornston School of Art, where I went in Dundee, was in the basement. And I just couldn't stand the thought of spending three years in the basement. So I was wandering around the art school, trying to decide what to specialize in. And the printed textile department was right at the top of the building, well, almost at the top. And it overlooked the River Tay um, over to Fife. It was just beautiful. I was like, oh, yeah, big sunny windows like this. This could be my home for three years. So I selected printed textiles based on the quality of the light in the studio <laughs> and ended up, um, yeah, training to be a textile designer. But I was super broke at the time. And anyone that's ever done any silkscreen printing knows that when you are doing your printing, every color costs. Um, every color is on a layer. So if you have a five color print, it's five times more expensive than a single color print. So I started to specialize in black and white work because I just didn't have any money for colors and ink. And I didn't have a computer, so everything was hand drawn. I think at one point I began to panic that my portfolio wasn't going to have color. So maybe I was going to get marked down. So I thought to balance that out, I'll make these drawings really intricate, really detailed. And that was sort of how the style was born. I started doing these really intricate hand-drawn black and white drawings. And then I would silkscreen print them in monochrome. And it, it kind of got the attention of a few folk. I think I left art school with a portfolio that was very different to what everyone else was doing in textile design at the time. You know, we have these things called trend forecasting websites where they go, next year, it's lilac. Everyone needs to be doing lilac. And the prints are all going to be architectural, like inspired and because I was limited to doing hand-drawn stuff in black and white, I just couldn't listen to any of that advice. So whilst everyone else is bang on trend, here is me with my kind of odd black and white portfolio of hand-drawn stuff. And it actually 
was the best thing because then my work really stood out at the end and after graduation I got some job offers and some freelance work so it all sort of started ticking over and I ended up being a freelance illustrator specializing in those kinds of drawings some people would say to me oh you would get more work if you could do characters or if you could do typography or computer generated work and I would remember thinking why do I want to be like everyone else and I'm never going to be as good as them I think being a one-trick pony is probably going to be the key to me you know getting work here so I want to become known as the girl that does the hand-drawn black and white artwork usually pretty floral and my clients would say to me kind of tongue-in-cheek oh these black and white drawings they would make a great coloring book and we would all laugh but it kind of planted the seed of an idea so then when a publishing company contacted me and said would you like to do a children's coloring book I was like, I would absolutely like to do a colouring book, but I want to do one for adults. And that was back in 2011 when adult colouring wasn't really what it is now. And they were like, well, yeah, maybe. And I was like, oh, it's going to be really beautiful and it'll be elegant and sophisticated. And the same kind of artwork that I was doing for like the perfume brands and the champagne companies, like just something really refined. And they were like, yeah, we're not sure. So I drew up the first five pages and sent them over. And they're like, okay, well, we'll maybe give it a go. So that was that was her secret garden happened, and that was the very first book. And you you say that two thousand and eleven, and you were asked, you, what was what was this reaction to your kind of request to do one for adults, uh, and and why were you so keen to to do it for adults rather than children as they as they sort of requested. I just didn't really like the idea of doing really simple drawings. Like I love doing really intricate artwork and for a kid's book, if you make it too detailed, they're just going to get frustrated. There's no, there's no point. Um, And for me, I was just really selfish. And my freelance practice at that point was really busy. Like I was easily working 40 hours a week for my clients all over the world. And this coloring book would be an extra project. Like, and I felt if I was going to do something additional in the evenings and at weekends, on top of all my commission work, then I had to really love doing it. And I just love the idea of making something really beautiful and elegant and yeah, just different. And I thought if I myself would like to color it, then maybe a few other people might like to color it too. And I remember the publishers like, well, the sales team don't know where to put it. Is it a children's book or is it an adult's book? Is it an activity book or what? We don't know if it's gifting. Nobody knows what to do with this thing. And they'd printed up 13,000 copies in the first print run of Secret Garden. I don't remember hearing that number and I phoned my mum. I said, you are going to have to buy a lot of these books because I don't know how publishing works. And if they ask for that advance back because we haven't sold them, I've spent it. So we need to make sure we get through those 13,000 copies. And luckily we were all right. (laughs) Yes, you were more than all right. And now, I mean, now there's this great popularity and buzz around um, drawing for for adults, colouring in the kind of therapy of, of, of that. Do you feel vindicated? very pleased to see that or or, yeah how do you feel yeah of course of course I think anything that encourages people to put down their devices and pick up a pen or pencil has to be a good thing Uh, I get stories from people all over the world in all walks of life you know whether they're like I have 911 call handlers get in touch with me like kids at school that are studying for exams people that are in retirement homes busy mums every walk of life I get messages from folk and they're like that you know it brought us back to being creative and I think being creative is so fundamental to us all I don't think there are creative people and uncreative people there's just people the problem is we forget so you never see a toddler holding a crayon racked with self-doubt they are too busy drawing on the wall because they haven't learned yet to be like scared of their creativity or get in their own way and as we become adults I think we start doubting ourselves and we lose the confidence I'm like oh no I can't I can't draw And it's just, it's such a loss. So I think books like these um, and colouring books, they take away the scariness of being creative. You don't need to start with a blank page. You don't need to sign up for a crazy course or buy an easel or have a studio at home. All you need is your book and a couple of really basic pencil case items. And then you can be creative. And especially with the colouring books, I think there's no blank page. The outlines are there. All you have to do is bring the colour. So it's such an accessible way to be creative and with the drawing tutorials and you know the bits where you have to simply complete a drawing again it's it's just so accessible it takes away that that edginess that you might have about being creative so that you can then further your your creative adventures why, why do you think it's now sort of taken off in this way 
I think we're just fatigued with all the digital stuff. I think people are just craving a way to disconnect, to have a reason to stop scrolling or like tapping and all those things. And whilst I do love this side of digital that has made coloring a community and creativity, like we have coloring groups online and you can, you know, share a video of what you're doing and watch a great tutorial. I think generally speaking, there's very few opportunities now where you can just be in flow and take some time out and focus on one singular thing. So creativity, when you have pencils and pens, you know, it's analog, it's just a mini digital detox for your brain. And that feeling of losing yourself and being, you know, consumed in a task, I experience that every day when I'm at work. Like, I love it. It's just like everything else just melts away and you're in your own wee bubble and you'll know yourself when you're crapping everything just is melts and you're just focused on this thing and it's so rare to get the opportunity to do that and I think I think that's why people have really taken to it. Yeah absolutely I was interested to hear you say that about the digital community because there is that balance isn't there between now anything that sort of in one sense is driven by a desire to leave the digital and the kind of 24-7 bombardment of of whatsapps and emails does necessitate uh, some sort of an online element because of course you've built up this extraordinary community and you encourage people to to sort of show them online so there is that balance to get right isn't there yeah I think it's definitely about balance and boundaries so I myself say that I'm an incubangelist I like pens and pencils and not pixels however I obviously own a laptop and I do scan all my drawings and digitize them and you know work on them in photoshop before I send the files to the publishers but the important thing is that the the digital side, the computer is a tool. The creativity happens on the pencil, on the paper, sorry, with pencil and pen. And I think it's about knowing how to use that tool, but not let it dictate or define things. And it's definitely, yeah, a fine balancing act, but we would not have the community that we have around the world without all the social media. And I think it's just an incredible thing to see an activity which is basically done individually on your own probably like in isolation you're not doing it in a big group activity but then it connects so many people and I think that's just a really lovely side to being creative that you wouldn't have seen without social media yeah absolutely and I mean we were talking about this idea of art as therapy which is becoming I think um there's more and more of an understanding around that or perhaps more talk about it it's actually sort of age old in in a sense but uh, what is it would you say that's so calming and soothing about it and do you have to be good at it to reap the benefits so it depends well the, the whole notion of being good at it I kind of have an issue with because yeah. I don't know what good at it is so there's there's plenty there's millions of people far more talented than me yeah I'm the one drawing the books I think it's just it's a skill and a practice it's just like your handwriting when you start off writing at age five, your A's looks a little bit wobbly and your S's looks weird. But with practice and muscle memory, you sort of refine those skills and become very good, hopefully, at handwriting. And I think it's the same with creativity. I think a lot of it is muscle memory, a bit of confidence. Um, and I think people, once they get over their initial hurdles, will find that they can fall back into creativity and express themselves in terms of you know the well-being aspects to it there's something just very people use the word mindful I can see the sort of how people would feel it was almost like a kind of meditation like coloring isn't taxing it's not the same as reading a book or even drawing coloring is when you are just simply adding color to those outlines and the task is so simple and it's almost like the more simplified and stripped back the task I think the more that your brain can just relax and tackle the job at hand and you're not constantly thinking of other things and getting distracted I think it is that ability of creativity to just pull you into such a narrow little field and let everything else blur out it's like one of those Instagram filters um, I think that's just a really amazing thing and we are so rarely in a position where we can just focus like there's so much noise going on so I think we just naturally crave that and tell I mean when it comes to this book I just want to keep showing it because it's so beautiful and so so with with regards to that everything you've just said sort of ties in I mean this is aimed at everyone and 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 you know why I suppose 30 days and and can you get is 10 minutes a day as you encourage that that's enough 
Well, I did a lot of research about habit formation and how long it takes to adopt a habit and for it to, you know, remain with you. And I came to the conclusion that nobody has any idea. There's just so many different numbers. I was like, well, if everyone else is picking a number, I'm going to pick a number too. And the number I'm going to pick is going to be achievable because life is hard enough. I don't need anything more difficult to do. So why set yourself up for failure? I think lower the goalposts, the goalposts, lower the target, make it a bit easier for yourself. And also when we achieve something, you like you get you get those good happy vibes and you're more encouraged to keep going. Um, and so 10 minutes felt achievable. You probably spend more than 10 minutes scrolling on Instagram per hour. So 10 minutes a day is going to be okay. And people have asked, well, why 30 days? It's like, well, it just felt like a nice, it's like a month-ish, isn't it? It's not a year. It's not 100 days. I think if you start off with a big number right away, you're just so overwhelmed with it. My feeling is a lot of this is confidence and building routine and getting used to putting down the devices and picking up pens and pencils. And if that becomes part of your daily routine and lifestyle, then you're more likely to continue with it. And I definitely find that a wee bit of creativity every day. So not the stuff that I do for work, other stuff uh, with no deadlines and no clients. I find that really helps balance me out. It's really calming. I'm sure it's the same as you know, some people have a yoga practice, some people really enjoy ironing, I just really enjoy drawing. Uh, and I just felt 10 minutes a day for 30 days was enough to sort of build that foundation so that you could then go on and continue your practice. And I should say as well, the the exercises in the book, there's some that are drawing, there are some that are colouring. Let me see, like, so here's a wee page of robots, um, you probably wouldn't colour the entire page in 10 minutes. You would pick one robot. And the idea is that you dip in and out of the book. The exercises aren't numbered. So you pick the flow. You flip through it. You find a page that sparks joy for you that day. Maybe you are totally into colouring that day. Maybe you want to do a wee bit of a drawing tutorial, like a step-by-step -step or just a doodle page, like an inky daydream. Um, you do your 10 minutes. If you want, you can continue or you just close your book and you're done. And I love the idea that you can come back for inky second helpings. So you can do the same page over and over. It's just 10 minutes a day for 30 days. And at the front, there's a wee habit um, tracker. So there's 30 little circles there, all numbered 1 to 30. And each day that you could complete your 10 minutes, you colour in one of those wee circles and you'll soon start to see a chain appear. And your one job is to not break that chain, to keep going. And that was one thing that I did take away from all my habit research, that having a visual chain or train um, and tracking that and being accountable and maybe even sharing that you know with somebody else sticking it on your social media so other people can see your progress that really helps you keep going and like I really hoped that after your 30 days it would have become so ingrained that you're more likely to keep going and dip back in and out. Mm. Absolutely and and one of the things I mean it's as well you have bits of of, of text sort of feeding into the book about you know things we should avoid um one of the things you say is progress not perfection and it is this drive for perfection in so much that we do that gets in the way and stops us from sort of being these kind of um creative playful selves and doing things with abandon as we might have done when we were younger so you're encouraging people to just let go of any idea of making this perfect yeah, it was actually, it's a concept I've been thinking about for ages, about how perfection gets in the way. And then I think I read it um, in Marie Forleo's book and it just, I was like, yeah, that's it. Progress, not perfection. Perfection isn't, you know, it's not defined. Like, what is that? Like, when will we reach perfect in anything? It's just, it's so, like, how can you strive for a goal that isn't defined and pinpointed down? It just feels like you're setting yourself up for failure. So instead of that, I say, forget about perfection, just aim for progress. Try and make the drawing that you do today better than the drawing that you did yesterday. And some days it'll be great and some days it'll be marginally better and some days it'll be worse, but you have to learn to just let go of those days where it's worse and just keep on those gradual gains. And that's the way that I felt about my drawing all through school and art school. And even now, I just try to make each book better than the book before, each project better than the project before. And I think that concept of not aiming for perfection, but just to get better is one that can apply to so many bits of life. Like it feels like a healthier, more compassionate mindset to have for yourself. Yeah, absolutely.